Take out your Bible, if you would, and find Daniel chapter 3. You'll enjoy and get more out of the lesson if you'll follow along. You can notice words and verses and maybe underline them for later use. We're continuing the study of the first six chapters of Daniel. Faith under fire or faith in the fire. God's in control. And this morning we're addressing the subject when they call for open-mindedness. There's a time in our life when we realize that those who are coming into our country are no longer interested as they perhaps were in the past about American culture, American language, English. More and more we're dividing into our subcultures, if you will. We're not assimilating into society as much and it's separating us from those in our communities. It would be easy this morning to suggest that it hasn't happened before, but it has. There are pockets in every state of our union that represent areas of immigrants who come in, they've settled in neighborhoods, they've enlarged, they have pretty much the language, the stores. It's going on for many, many years. It's not new. And this new idea of tolerance of open-mindedness, multiculturalism, we might suggest those too are new, but they're not. We're going to see this morning from Daniel chapter 3, there was a desire to pull everything together and make everything to be all right. Three young men took a stand, and we'll see that this morning, and apply some of the lessons from this chapter to our lives we think of Scripture doing to others as you would have them doing to you. And we think of words such as, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And those are important principles that Christians live by. But they are used to, uh, to project in our society these ways of thinking that are very much different than what those principles are designed to teach. For instance, there's a new tolerance in America. Really, it's not new, but we think of it as new. It goes something like this. Listen to this statement. It not only demands that we be tolerant of the rights of others to believe what they want, it teaches that the ways of each culture must be recognized as equally valid and right. And that's the edge, if you will, for Christians. Let me read it again. It's a mindset that says that no culture is better than any other. That's true. No matter what strange or destructive ideas it holds, that's when we need discernment. And if you say anything different, you're a bigot. In other words, believe what you want, but don't suggest that anyone else is doing anything wrong. Or accept what I believe, or I'll not accept you. Or I'll turn it very negative against you. And that's happening in our world. It's happening in our country. There are loving, kind, patient people who honor God. And because of that, they have principles that are steadfast in their thinking. They represent principles upon which we base our lives. And if they're at odds with other principles, we can be loving and patient and kind to other people, but we don't have to believe those things are okay. And that's the problem of what's been going on in recent years in our culture. When we were in China, one of our students, one of the brightest students, as it spoke to his leadership talents, he had chosen the English name Obama. And in one of the classes, the idea came up that we are a country that many times we don't agree with what others are teaching or proposing. And they seem surprised that in this country there are several hundreds of thousands of people that might not vote for someone running for office. 
And they just were surprised. And of course, in a communist country, there is no vote. And you must agree with the one in authority. So we understood the surprise. But I used the occasion to tell them that if people believe in certain principles that are morally wrong in my mind from God's point of view, then I will be opposed to that person being in charge and pushing those principles upon me or upon the country. And they began to understand that things that are important to us morally, we cannot accept. And we try to bring about change, and that's why we have elections. And by the way, Christians get what they deserve if they don't vote, and others are voted into office that don't follow Christian principles, and that's the most that you'll hear from me about voting, but we get what we deserve as Americans. When we vote for the people, we vote for. But have you noticed that some of those who preach tolerance and multiculturalism seem just a bit intolerant of our Christian belief structures? You notice that? Have you noticed that in today's social climate you can say and do almost anything you want as long as you don't express your view that someone else's belief or behavior is wrong based upon God's guidelines? Why is it that those who scream tolerance the loudest are so intolerant of the moral base on which this country was built? and the people who represented this country in its beginning. Everything is tolerated, if you will, except good old Judeo-Christian ethics. Seems to be the buzzword today. But you know there's nothing new under the sun. It's not the first time these things are happening. We know in the New Testament that the Jews and other practicing of religions, they could pretty much say and do what they wanted as long as when they offered that sacrifice, they took out just a little bit of incense and threw it into the fire and dedicated it to Caesar and said the words, Caesar is God. Do what you want, believe what you want, but you've got to give deference and offer that incense, if you will, at the same time and say, Caesar is Lord or Caesar is God. Those things happen in the New Testament time. And I've been in discussions with people that would say, well, just do it even though you don't believe it. And they would suggest, don't lose your life standing up for that, knowing that if you live 20 or 30 more years, all the good that you could do and yet you make the statement and they backtrack a little bit, but I'm not certain it's as understandable to them as it is to others that if I believe that Jehovah God is God, King of kings, Lord of lords, I will not say someone else is God or someone else is Lord. I won't do that. My belief won't allow me to do that, even if I do it with the my fingers crossed behind my back, which is the thing we used to do as young people, children really, to tell a lie, and because our fingers were crossed, it was as if we really didn't tell a lie. Well, that's a game we play, so we can tell lies. But the suggestion is that you can do that, it's all right, as long as you say or believe that Caesar is Lord and offer the incense to him at the same time you offer the sacrifice to God. We live in a country, and it's been this way for a long time, that says it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. And then another statement that I've heard a number of times, and they're saying it to someone they know as a minister of a congregation in the city, there's only one God, and there's a lot of different ways to get to Him. Well, that's what they would hope would be true, because they're taking away that leaves Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, out of the picture. But that's the statement that we hear from time to time, 
said by people sincere a belief in God but I don't believe in Christ or I'm not going to have an allegiance to the church which Christ built and the list could go on and on the reality is there are some things that aren't equally right as it speaks to God's way God's directives and it's important for us this morning to rehearse, if you will, a time, a children's story, but it's not taught until they're in the fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth grade because it's a really strong story, but it's a very powerful message that at some point our fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and high school age and young people, these are young people here, we believe the first chapters dealt with late teenagers, but most people who study the languages and study the book believe that two to three years, maybe as many as four, some say 16 years, pass between chapter two and chapter three. If it's 16 years, then these young men are in their early 30s. Let's read Daniel chapter three. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. And he then summoned, and there's a list of officials, I'll let you read them, and he told them to come to the dedication of the image that he set up. And verse 3 is the response of all of that list of officials and people in the kingdom who come to the idol and they stood before it. And there was a dedication planned. Verse 4, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do. O peoples, nations, and men of every language, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Now I was reading and planning this lesson a number of weeks ago when I saw, I think for the first time, this multiculturalism metaphor. All kinds of music. I had not seen that before. So it's as if to say that there may be music presented and it would represent all kinds of music from all kinds of instruments as if that would make it okay to then do what you're asked to do. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the Again, the list of the instruments, all the peoples, all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Sounds like everything's proceeding just fine. The person in authority playing all kinds of music so as to appeal to all the nations of people who had gathered there under a command of this king doing something that to some people would say, well, it's not that big a deal. Just bow down and go home and honor God. But at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. The Jews did not bow down. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. So you're giving him words to by charming to his ear, king, you're a king, you're an eternal king, as if a god, and saying things pleasant to his ears, but you've issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn and flute and zither and lyre and harp and pipes and all kinds of music, three times we hear that, must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Teenagers, now probably in their early 30s, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. 
They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. So they weren't contrary to this one command. They had not been serving the gods of this country. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men who brought, were brought before the king, and he said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn and flute and zither and lyre and harp and pipes and all kinds of music, four times we've heard that, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. In other words, did you not understand? Is there something I'm missing? Did you just not think? I'll give you this next opportunity to do it the way you were told. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? God, little g, one of the created gods that he worshipped. He was saying, which of my gods is going to help you in this circumstance? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, I would hope, something similar to what we would say. Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, the God of heaven and earth, is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we know, or we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. One of the things we see very quickly from these first verses is the clarity on the part of the command, Nebuchadnezzar. It's very clear what he was expecting. It's very clear that many instruments and all kinds of music were used to entice many nations of people to come and do that which they were told to do. The inference seems to suggest that they were appealing to people not necessarily under him as king, but appealing to them through that which was part of their culture to come in and then be able, willing to do what he had commanded them to do. This many kinds of music, four times we're told that. It speaks to this multiculturalism, this open-mindedness that's a part of the culture in which we live today. And then, there's the reality, it doesn't really matter. Abraham Lincoln seems to be one with wisdom, but also wit. History tells us something that he is to have said a number of times in his life. It was a favorite brain teaser that he used to make a point with his constituents. He would ask this question, how many legs would a wolf have if you call his tail a leg? I'll repeat the question. How many legs would a sheep have if you called his tail a leg? Naturally, they would respond with what answer? Five? And he would say, wrong. The sheep would still have four legs. Calling something a leg doesn't make it so. You can call it what you want to, but how many legs does a sheep have? Four. And that's what's going on in many cultures within our borders and in other parts of the world as well. Calling something something it isn't isn't changing what it is. And that simple wit-filled statement reminds us of that. And we can look at 
And then we can laugh about it when we answer the question five and then realize, wait a minute, you're tricking me, no? How many legs does a sheep have? That's a simple question with only one answer. Unless something's gone astray and he's lost one, and that's a different discussion. Clarity. What's interesting at this point, there's a constancy also involved in this story. I was told as a young person, you'll never stand up, you'll never stand out in the most difficult times if you don't stand up and stand out in the simpler things of life. In other words, if you just go along in little matters, simple matters, less stressful matters, the likelihood of you not standing up for something, some conviction, that's another C we'll look at in a moment, then it's not going to happen. Now, our parents would encourage us, I hope you are, practice what you're going to say in the back seat when you're in the car with your four closest friends. Practice now when they're not here, when there's no pressure, practice what you're going to say. So that you'll have the words and you practice them and of course you believe them and then if they have any respect for you, when you say those things, you prepared yourself to say them, you do say them, hopefully they'll respect you and if they don't, it's not the kind of friends you need anyway. I know that's hard for some young people to hear. I've had that discussion recently with older adults. They're not really your friends if, and you have a discussion. So there's a constancy. It begins when you're young. And with these men along with Daniel, they decided we're not going to eat these foods. We're not going to go along with some of these things that are, that are cult-like, as we looked at chapter 1. When they're trying to change you from the inside, they're changing your name, they're changing your, your lifestyle, they're changing literally the things you eat. And what's interesting, they went along with some of it, it seemed, but there were some things they would not go along with because they believed that food defiled them as Jews, part of the nation of Israel. So there's some things they could get along with, but they would not leave that core principle. And they did it when they were young, and they did it as they were growing older. What are some things as a fourth grader, as you look back, that you stood up for, and you stood out when you did it? Fifth grade. Sixth grade, seventh grade, high school years, young adult years, things you stood up for, preparing you for that big moment sometimes perhaps when someone's going to say, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And it's no big deal because you've said it, you've acted upon similar principles all of your growing up years. It's easier. Not easy, but easier when you have to stand up and then you stand out among the peers in the midst of the pressures. Practice in the quiet privacy of your home without your friends there pressuring you. Practice saying the things you need to say as a Christian young person, as a Christian adult, when it comes up at the workplace, when it comes up when you're in the back seat of the car and your four closest friends are there, practice it so you can say it and believe it when that moment comes. And yes, that moment will come. And it involves convictions. We are not bowing down to that gold image. And our God can protect us from you. How? Maybe it would take his life, but that would protect them eternally from Nebuchadnezzar. But if he chooses not to deliver us in the way that they were surmising in their thoughts, he still is going to deliver them in their minds. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of God that you have set up. I'm curious 
And you can only answer this question in your heart of hearts. And it's something I want you to ponder today and later this week. What are your convictions? What are the things that are at the top of the list that you will not do? And they're convictions based upon a belief system that you believe is firm. It's black and white, if you will, in terms of clear. There's no gray areas. We use colors to distinguish a metaphor. It's clear what I should do. Scripture tells me what I should do. It tells me what I should believe. Do we believe in God? Do we believe that Christ was the Son of God? Do we believe those who wrote the Scripture give us the pathway to eternal life in this book of books? And especially the New Testament pattern is given to the church. Where are our convictions? What are they? What will I stand up and never, ever back away from? If we can't name five or six or seven or eight, it's time. It's time to look at them and think about them and practice them then in the privacy of our homes so that we'll be able to stand up and stand out when God might bring us to a time where our faith will be questioned and He is listening. And He wants us to stand up. Is this a new thing? No. The book of Daniel goes back hundreds of years. It's happening right here before us. Do you admire 31, 32 year old men who could say such things? Don't we just clap and say, wow, I admire those three young men. I admire what they said. I admire what they did. I admire what they were willing to let happen to them because of the conviction that God is the God of heaven and earth. And I will not bow down. I will not serve your gods. Nebuchadnezzar was furious and his attitude changed toward them. It's as if he was willing to say and do anything in an accommodative way because they'd already refused to do what he'd said. Only when the astrologers had brought these Jewish men and hit their inactions to his attention and so his attitude changed toward them. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Why extra hot? Why the strong men? Because he wanted the result to be clear. You have disobeyed my command. And these men wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. It's interesting if you think about it, why this list of all the things these Jewish young men were wearing? What's the one constant with that list that we've just been given? They're all flammable. They're all flammable. And the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. It wasn't as if they were able to lead them to the edge and cast them in as they grew near to the flame, to the fire, to the heat. They were taken out and it's as if the three young men were falling into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, wasn't it three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. And he says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Something about his radiance, his appearance, 
made him think about the gods that he worshipped. And Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. If we have a constancy about our convictions, if we gradually act upon the easier convictions as we've grown older, when we're brought to the time when we must stand up and we will stand out, we will have the courage to act upon those convictions and people will notice and they will give God glory. It's not about me. Nebuchadnezzar knew it had little to do with them. He realized this is something very different. He acknowledged it to be something of an origin other than from these three men. And Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. We're not left to wonder God's point of view about this matter, the Holy Spirit guiding men of God to write this for us. They trusted in the God of heaven and earth the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in trusting in God, it forced them to defile the king's command. If you trust in God, there are times when we must obey God rather than men. And there are times in our country when our country may bring about laws that in and of themselves may be in place in different states or in our country. But is it in allegiance or is it opposed to godly principles? Is something legal? That's not the question for a Christian. Is something right or wrong from God's perspective? There are sometimes men bring about enact enactments of law that are against God's law. The fact that it's legal is not the question for a Christian in some areas of moral actions. And so they defiled the king's command. They were willing to give up their lives. I'm not going to mention the movie, I'm not going to mention the movie star who was in it, but there's a, a well-received movie a number of years ago depicting a young man who said, and it was portrayed throughout the early parts of the movie, I'm just not afraid to die. And he showed himself to be very brave. And several times in the movie, he would go and rescue people against odds that were many times above what he normally could take care of. I'm not afraid to die. They said, how can you do these things? How can you be so brave? I'm not afraid to die. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego would have said the same thing. For Christians today, what is death? What do we know from New Testament principles? It's sleep. From a spiritual perspective, it's sleep. It's a passageway into the presence of eternity without pain and sorrow. It's a place of comfort initially, Abraham's bosom, but heaven without pain and sorrow and pressure and all the things that are part of this earth. As Christians, we've entered eternity already. But that eternity is not without these negatives because we're still in part of life, if you will, upon earth. So we're not afraid to die either, are we? There's a resurrection. And that doesn't mean we're fatalistic and we just don't care about living, but ultimately, spiritually speaking, we're willing to defile those who are against God. We're not afraid to die. And it says, as it makes the list further, they were not going to serve or worship 
any God except their own God, capital G. And I hope each of us sitting here this morning, we may not know when we will be called to stand up and stand out. We don't know if it will ever happen in a way that would be even closely related to what we're seeing here. But I hope we can say and then develop the courage and our convictions to say, I will serve God in my life. I will serve God. If we don't have that conviction, we won't serve Him when things are difficult. If we think anything goes, everything's equal, you're a right to your own opinion, you have that right, then that conviction isn't as necessary, is it? But what these young men teach us and what Scripture is trying to tell us is it takes courage. Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body, and they're unable to kill the soul, but rather fear Him, God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's a reverential fear there. The one who touches on eternity is the one that needs to be at the forefront of our thinking. The one who involves eternity is the one that is the master of my thinking and of my decisions and therefore of every action that I'm about. Courage behind God. I want to close by reading you something. It's hanging in my office. It has for 30 plus years. It's on our website. I'll be glad to print it in a fancy form if it's something you want to adopt for yourself and hang in a public place and slowly and with time come to believe in what it's saying. I'm going to close with this anonymous writing that speaks to this subject. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded or rewarded. I now live by present, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let go, or slow up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till He comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till He stops. And when He comes to get His own, He'll have no problems recognizing me. My colors will be clear. 
this morning, be sure your colors are clear. Let's stand and sing. Not a cloud. 